Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the, the final session of the Connected Everything 2020 conference. Um, so hi, Murate. Um, so this is our early career researcher session, and, and this is um, and this is really just um, to oh, I'll start again. <laughs> um, so this this session is, is really looking at the activities we want to do around early career research within the network. So Connected Everything is really dedicated to trying to develop the future leaders within digital manufacturing, and that's in academia and industry. So I want this to be quite an informal session. So if you've got any questions, you can put them in the Q&A. Hopefully you all know how to use that. It's on the right hand side of your screen, or you can put it in the chat. I think what we're going to do is first of all, we've got a presentation from Katie Walk from the EPSRC. And then we'll have a few questions to Katie. And if, if you ask a question, what I'll try and do is, is unmute you and we'll add you as a presenter so you can ask that. Then we're going to move on to um, Ken Lutis and Eva Lutis, who I'll introduce after, who are going to give a talk about work of industry, because this is one of the topics we've um, um, that's been brought to our attention quite a lot for early career researchers. How do you make those links with industry? How do you manage those links um, more effectively throughout your career? So to start with, we've got Katie Walker. So Katie's one of the manufacturing the future team in the EPSRC. She's responsible for digital manufacturing, engineering design. She's also our, our main contact in Connected Everything. So if you could play Katie's video now, please. Hi, I'm Katie Walker. I'm one of the portfolio managers in the Manufacturing the Future theme in EPSRC. Today, I'm just going to go through a quick funding guide um, that will help early career researchers. First thing we'll do is we'll just have a quick look through the peer review process in general. The peer review process is used to make judgments on proposals submitted to EPSRC and decide whether they're suitable for funding. It does underpin all of our funding decisions. Although different schemes and calls may use slightly different processes, there is a fixed criteria of assessment that EPSRC uses. However, some calls and schemes may have optional extras. Whatever the assessment criteria or submission rules, they will be publicised clearly before submission. These processes are constantly evolving to keep up with the necessary changes, so it is always worthwhile looking up the relevant process, even if it's one you submitted to before. This is an example of our peer review process for standard mode. The other processes might be slightly different, but this is a good place to start. So once proposals have been submitted to EPSRC, they're given to the relevant portfolio manager to send out to review. Initially, they will send it out to three reviewers, including one you have identified in your application. The remaining reviewers will be found through the EPSRC Peer Review College. Once reviews have come back, if they are deemed unsupportive and the proposal is therefore uncompetitive at panel, it will be rejected at that stage. If reviews are mixed, it will be sent back out for additional reviews. If the reviews are deemed generally supportive, we will then send it out to PR response for you to have the opportunity to respond to any issues raised. Next, both the PR responses and the reviews will be sent to a panel. The purpose of the panel is to generate a rank ordered list of proposals in a priority order for funding. Different grant schemes and themes will be on separate lists. Panel members act as a jury and only ever use the evidence in front of them. They are not allowed to re-review the proposal. What they can do is comment on the reviewer's comments and how you as PI have responded to any of the issues that have been raised. The number and composition of the panel members is specific to the range of proposals being ranked and most panellists will be selected from our peer review college. Each proposal will be assigned three introducers. Two of these will be generalists and one, the secondary introducer, will have expertise matched to the proposals. Once we have our rank ordered list, this will be given to the theme leads. Then, considering the budget they've been set by council, theme leads will go down the list and fund as far as their budget allows, or as far as grants have been deemed fundable. All proposals that come into EPSRC will be assessed along the lines of these basic assessment criteria. So that includes research quality, which will always be a primary criterion, national importance, impact, applicants and partnerships, and resources and management. Other calls and schemes may well have additional criteria, but they will all at least follow the basics. 
I'm not going to go through all of these in detail right now. I'm more than happy to answer questions in the Q&A session. As with general assessment criteria, all grants are also subject to general eligibility criteria. The key things here are that investigators must be academic employees, so lecturers or equivalent, at eligible organisations within the UK. The principal investigators and co-investigators should also normally hold permanent posts. However, there are, are certain conditions where fixed term employees might be eligible. When it comes to research assistants, they cannot be principal investigators or co-investigators. However, they could be identified as research co-investigators, provided they've made a substantial contribution to the development of the application and they'll be employed on the project for a significant proportion of their time. If you are unsure about eligibility, please do have a look on the website or do contact one of the relevant portfolio managers. When you are first thinking about applying for a grant, it's important you considered which type of grant you're going to apply for. There are a range of different grant types and some of them are actually more suited to certain career stages. So as early career researchers, the grants most suited to you are initially the new investigator awards, the early career fellowships, as well as standard mode grants. As you become more established, other grant types will start to open up, including the established career fellowship, programme grants and critical mass grants, such as hubs and CDTs. If we focus on the grant types best suited to early career researchers, one thing I would like to highlight is that if you are considering applying for a new investigator award, it's important to note that one of the key conditions is that you have not been a principal investigator on previous grants. Therefore, if you are considering a new investigator award, it should be one of the first ones you apply for. The exception to that rule is that you may have been a principal investigator on an overseas travel grant. Standard grants and fellowships don't have these restrictions and they can be applied for in both responsive modes as well as various calls released throughout the year. I'm not going to go into any more details about these right now, but I am happy to answer questions um, later on in the Q&A. I would like to point you towards our calls page on the EPSRC website. This is regularly updated with the calls that we are all running and at the moment we do have three manufacturing calls going online. So we have the adventurous manufacturing one, which is one I'm running, and it seems to be quite suited to early career researchers. There's also the responsive manufacturing and precision manufacturing. If you have any questions about those, um, please feel free to either ask me in the Q&A or I'll direct you to the relevant portfolio manager. I'll now go through some general proposal writing tips. I'm afraid they are quite generic. So if you have any specific questions, please do ask me at the end in the question and answer session. One of the first things to consider when you're writing a proposal is the audience it's intended for. When you first submit your proposal, the people it will go to will be the portfolio managers and they'll have a general portfolio knowledge, but need to be able to understand the proposal in order to understand, assign appropriate reviewers. Therefore, it's really important that you are clear where the novelty in the research lies and what exactly the objectives are. For peer reviewers, they will have expert knowledge in the field of the proposal, so it's very important that you include the necessary detail for them to make an appropriate judgment. You really do need to try and impress them. For the panel, they'll also have expert knowledge in the general area, and it's important in your PI response that you include all the relevant information they need in order to make their decision. In general, all good proposals carry the excitement and the enthusiasm of the researcher whilst focusing on what the key research activity is. They are always about the excellence of the research, the scientific quality is always a primary criterion. They also clearly demonstrate the capability of the applicants, highlighting why the PIs and co-Is expertise are best placed to carry out this research and why any project partners are both relevant and how they support the research. Good proposals are always clear about the novelty and added value, so they're clear about what it is that's actually being researched and why it is relevant now and in the future. This is important both at the panel, but also when EPSRC are initially processing the grant and selecting appropriate reviewers. The ideas, methodologies and work plan need to be clear and understandable to both experts and non-experts alike. Do not have it cluttered with jargon so that non-specialist panel members don't understand it, but equally don't make it so vague that experts will be unable to make appropriate decisions. 
pitch the proposal to an appropriate and realistic degree of ambition. Do make sure that what you have proposed has clear and achievable objectives and that they are clearly stated. And finally, don't leave questions unanswered and rely on the PI response to go into further details. There is a danger that it may not make it to that stage. One of the first things you should do once you've finished writing a proposal is go back to it and just double check that it is easy to read. Make sure that it's got a clear and relevant title. And the objectives are clear and easy to locate. Make sure that the summary is well written and accessible to non-experts, as this is actually the summary that will ultimately be uploaded to the website if the grant is funded. Try where possible to limit the technical jargon. Obviously, a certain amount is needed to explain the science, but if it's not needed, don't include it. Also, please explain acronyms on first usage. There is nothing worse than having to look up an acronym because it hasn't been explained in the proposal. And finally, do not expect reviewers to read the links. In fact, we actively discourage you from using them because all the relevant information should be included and clearly written in the proposal itself. Remember the basics. What is it that you're planning to do? How are you planning to do it? And why is this important? In my opinion, one of the best things you can do after you've written your proposal and you're going to submit it is to actually go back and look through it thinking like a reviewer or panel member. So go online and locate the reviewer form for the scheme which you've applied for and then go through it as if reviewing this with fresh eyes. Ask yourself, is it easy to read? Is the panel member or reviewer going to be able to find the answers to the criterion easily? Is it going to excite them and have you got that enthusiasm across? And why is it they should be advocating this over other proposals? It's also a good idea to see if you can identify any strengths and weaknesses that you can address before submitting. What is it that you might be missing? It's also important to say how it fits into the current research landscape. On this point, you need to be fairly specific, especially if linking to EPSRC. Try to focus on which themes and which of the priorities within these themes it might be related to. There is less use describing how it fits into the EPSRC's different nations identified in the delivery plan, as these are often too broad. By design, all research directed to EPSRC will fall under one or more of these nations, so be specific. Other things to consider include having a colleague or person outside of your research group look through the proposal, not just to help with general checks, but also to look at it as a reviewer themselves. It really is worth downloading a reviewer form along with any specific guidance and assessment criteria relevant to the scheme you're applying for and asking someone to review a proposal as if they've been contacted to be a reviewer by EPSRC. It can also be a good idea to look at previously successful proposals, particularly if it is for a scheme with slightly different criteria to normal. Information on our funded grants can be found on grants on the web if you wish to contact any of these applicants for advice. And finally, Please do look out for any training or guidance that's been produced by the research offices at your institutions. They may have specific guidelines or instructions and processes prior to it being submitted to EPSRC. So please ensure you've looked through these and have followed the steps necessary before you submit. Once you've submitted your proposal and it has been sent out to review, the next stage if those reviews are generally supportive is the PI response. The PI response or applicant response to reviewers is one of the most important stages of the peer review process and is the PI's right to reply. Generally, you are given five working days and no longer than two pages in length, so it is important you make best use of this space. Read through the reviewer's comments carefully and do respond to all of the issues raised. Try not to ignore any of them. Carefully consider the comments and provide evidence to either expand on missing information or explain that the reviewer may have misunderstood your intentions. Don't use other reviewers' comments to try and review the concerns of another. Instead, provide evidence from the proposal or new information to clarify. Do not use the space to attack the reviewers. Using this limited space to vilify unsuitable or biased reviews is a wasted opportunity. If you have any major concerns about a reviewer, please contact the relevant portfolio manager. This is all important as a good PI response can often be significant during the panel process and can be the difference between a proposal being funded or rejected. 
One thing that will ultimately benefit you if you are going to be writing a lot of proposals in the future is to consider joining the EPSRC Peer Review College. If you apply and you're accepted, you'll be given online training that will help explain the details of the peer review process more clearly. It will give you a better understanding of how grants are reviewed and what it is reviewers are looking for in the proposal. From our point of view, it will also make you a better reviewer yourself and so will increase our list of suitable reviewers in your field. It will also help give you a better understanding of the panel process and what it is panellists are going to be looking for both in the reviewer comments and the PI response, all of which can be really useful when considering your own application. If you find yourself unsure whether you should be submitting your proposal to the EPSRC or another of the councils, please do consider using the EPSRC Remit Query service. All you need to do is go to the Remit Query page on the website and fill in the smart survey, including a general description of the research in question. We will then aim to get back to you within two weeks, although an actual decision can take longer depending on the nature of the query. And so to summarise, when applying for a grant, do read all of the guidance on the EPSRC website, particularly if it is a new scheme or one you have not applied to before. Do have a look at the review of forms and guidance and use these to look critically at your proposal before you submit. In the PI response, read reviewer comments carefully and provide a balanced response with the evidence needed to respond to the issues raised. Remember the basics. What are you planning to do? How are you planning to do it? And why is it important? If you have any questions, please check the EPSRC website, ask your colleagues, and if necessary, please contact us directly. I hope this has been useful and I'm looking forward to answering any of your questions. I'm happy to go into more detail about anything I've mentioned here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katie. Can the, um, Sally, can you make Katie a, a presenter as well so she can? So um, we've, got, we've got a few questions, Katie, but um, First of all, I just wanted to ask you something about impact because we know impact has changed in UKRI recently. So could you say something about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, if it's okay, I might actually share um, my slide again. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Hope this works. Okay, has that appeared in the chat? Yes, it's super yep. small. So yeah, so I think if you uh, click on the corner, you can expand it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So yes, so now the pathways to impact have been removed as a document that we need to upload. The impact assessment criteria has actually now been removed as a separate criteria, it has in fact been amalgamated and it's been primarily put into the research quality um, assessment criteria, which now actually does mean that it's, it's now a primary criterion as opposed to a, a secondary criterion. So from that point of view, it's, it is quite, important still that you do demonstrate uh, where where your grant is is likely to achieve impact and of course impact can be not just from um, various sort of public engagement activities I'm talking about knowledge impact um, and uh, like society and economy those sort of uh, parts of impact um, not just your, your general run-of-the-mill um, public engagement stuff. Brilliant, thanks. I think, I think some of the really good talk, I think the things that I've, I've noticed are really important is um, one, getting involved with the peer review process. So so as Katie was saying, you can sign up for that. And I think, I think uh, junior people go to a kind of associated um, peer review college first. But I think having actually reviewing other people's proposals is, is one of the most useful things to help write in your own proposals, I've found. And also using your, your colleagues within your university and your wider network just to review these. I mean, I, I've got people out. I'll send it to because I know they're very good at the, the kind of language, the grammar, the structure, whereas I know there are other people who are much better at the science and the argument. So you need, you need to build that up and it's really, really important. I think sometimes as an early career researcher, you're often scared about sending it to people because you, you're kind of putting your, your ideas out there and you're all if they don't like them, it, but it's really, really important. We're just going to go to some um, questions we've got. Some I think I know the answer to, but I'll, uh, I'll get you to answer again. So um, <laughs> I think the first ones um, we've got is, from let me see somewhere in chat and somewhere on no, 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 no. so we'll go to anna first can the presenters may um make anna a presenter sorry the organizers make anna a presenter please so she can ask her question
Appreciate it. it. Might it might not be possible because I know some. Oh, there we go. Hi Anna, how are you? Could do that. I thought you had to have a speaker account. Oh, Only <laughs> the team can work magic. Um, yeah. yeah. Please ask your question then. So my question is about the new investigator award and if there are any exceptions regarding um, internal grants that somebody can have from their own universities or if there is an, an absolute limit and if you reach that limit of funded uh, research that you have attracted, you can't apply for the new investigator. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And our criteria just state that you, you kind of had to have not previously have led an academic research group or been the recipient of um, like a significant grant. How there is significant? There is a value. Um, my, my advice would be to contact the relevant portfolio manager, explain the situation, and then they can get a clear answer for you. Um, yeah. I do wonder if it's sort of done case by case basis or, or what, but I'm afraid I, I have searched myself and I can't see any definitive um, cap as to, to what you can have previously been awarded. Yeah. Um, if you have ever received a, uh, a grant from EPSRC and you're listed as a PI, even if it was a, a parent child grant, um, you you are ineligible. Okay. Um, but yeah. if it's not EPSRC, then the rules are not that clearly stated. No, they're not. So, like I said, do do get in touch with with the relevant PM, and they'll they'll okay. let you know. Good, thank you. Uh, I thank think you. with that Anna, as well, it's um, I think the so the connected everything feasibility studies don't count because they're not a separate grant. My understanding, although Katie's absolutely right, check is if it's internal funding through the university, it doesn't count. Yeah, it, it usually it's doesn't. The external. Um, yeah. It gets a bit complicated with things like if you've had Innovate UK funding, Newton, um, Royal Academy Engineering, those Welcome Trust, those kind of things. So you just need to send them an email. Okay. Even if that internal funding allowed you to hire somebody else and work as an RA? Or... Yeah, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I had internal funding and I, through the uni and things like that, and I still applied for this. So it wasn't a problem. But, but that was a few years ago. So the rules might have changed. Okay. Yeah. It, it is always best just to check in case other yeah. um, criteria do come up. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. Right. Who's next on here? Um, so Stefania, I think I I answered your first question about the feasibility study, but can we get Stefania on because she's got another another question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, hi Stefania, how are you doing? Hi, good, good, thanks. Um, actually, I was really interested about the uh, peer review um, college and how does it work. So I communicate to the head of my department that I would like to contribute to a PSRC review, but is it through the university or do I need to contact EPSRC directly for being involved in this process? I would also contact EPSRC directly. It is always good, a good idea to have the, the backing of your department, um, particularly if you are going to end up taking some time to do reviews. Um, but I think at the moment, the key way to start, I think there is a smart survey um, application on our website. Um, okay. If there isn't, or it's not working for any reason, again, contact the PMs and they'll be able to send through uh, a link to you. Um, I don't think there's any particular recruitment drive at the moment, um, but I, I believe it is still open for you to register your interest. Okay, thanks. That's, that's interesting. Um, actually, since we are here, I jump in with another question related to the uh, EPSRC Fellowship Early Career, because I'm kind of deciding which one to apply to. And I have noticed that if you are not awarded the fellowship, you can still apply for the new investigator award. So I don't know what is the best strategy. Should I first try the new investigator award or the PSRC early career research fellowship? Oh, I don't know. It, <laughs> what is, it depends really which you would want. Um, yeah, I would like you said, if you, but... the <laughs> the first is if you are successful, then you can't get the new investigator the, award. Yeah. So okay. if you, if you do, if you're adamant you wanted to do both, do the new investigator award first. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Stefania. Um, we'll go to Marate next. If we can make Marate a presenter, please. Hello. Can you guys hear me? I noticed some, some, some participants have got their hands up, so I will come to you in a minute. Don't worry. Hi, Marate. Hi. So um, my question is, so when you... So I'm part of a of both of two networks, and I was wondering, um, how do you go about creating 
something like that for maybe a new or innovative topic? And also, is it too early for an early career researcher to, to do something like that? For your general networks, um, that there is no, that I'm aware of, um, no eligibility criteria that, that excludes early career researchers. Um, they go through standard mode and have normal criteria. Um, the difference with, um, so a network like this, for example, is a network plus, that has actually come through a specific call and they might have certain criteria. Um, so it depends. I guess it depends sort of what it is you're hoping to do first. Um, usually just go for a network first and then and then then go from there. Um, I think as long as you've as long as you're happy you've got the um the, the ability to, to do the network. Um if you again contact the relevant portfolio managers, see what's out there, um, see if that they they have a strategic need for a network, that might always help. Um they might be able to guide you to a few places as well. Thanks. Yeah, I think it's worth saying though, with the with a lot of the network pluses, you, you've kind of got to demonstrate uh, managing large projects. Yeah. Um, so you'd have to be able to show that you you've kind of handled that, which is which is something you might have done, and that's absolutely fine. But it, it's probably a bit more difficult as a early career researchers. But a lot a lot of the networks will have, um, with, with all of them, it's about developing future leaders. So they they should be having early career researchers involved in them. So it might be if there's a a topic area, a technology area that you think really needs a network, bringing those people together and saying, look, who's the person who's got the track record to, to really do it and the expertise to level up? Okay. So, it, so, it, so it, technically there's nothing to stop me, but because I'm an early career, I won't be eligible because I, I'm an early, like it's a, a chicken or the egg situation. Certainly for the network plus, for a normal network, mm -hmm. there isn't that eligibility criteria. Okay. Great. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's an eligibility issue. I think it's more of a would it be a competitive proposal if led by an early career researcher? That, but that's just my opinion on it. Okay, great. Brilliant. Well, well um, I think we've got Sam's got a question there. Um, can we make Sam Brooks presenter, please? Hi, hi Sam. Uh, hi. So, um, thank you for the information. Um, just one question i've seen in a few kind of epsrc grant proposals or like when you're looking at them they have something like repeatedly unsuccessful applicants policy um and mm -hmm. i haven't really met anyone who can really explain it to me <laughs> or what it is or when it kicks in and i was wondering whether as like an early career researcher uh, we should be aware of that or is it something that i should be worried about or aware of in the future um and is there anything you could tell me about it or is it kind of <laughs> Um, to be perfectly honest with you, it's not something that I've ever come across on the grants that I have uh, had to come into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. It is very rare that you are not allowed to submit because you've you've basically failed the the repeated submissions policy. Um, the only thing I would say is it it's not it's not designed to really stop you from applying. It is simply there to stop EPSRC from being spammed by um, academics putting in application after application that aren't that, that just isn't competitive um, and, and isn't able to go to panel. Um, so I don't think you've got anything to put it particularly to worry about um, in terms of uh, being caught out by the policy. Um, and you will you will definitely find out you will know before you are you reach that point, um, you know, even if it's just the portfolio manager getting in touch and saying you you are close to to reaching this this limit um and what sort of guidance do you need um when you the key thing to do is if you do have an application that goes through but it, it does fail is to just look at the feedback um give speak to your colleagues um speak to those um in the research office and see you know was there anything specific that is stopping you from going through was it was it just particularly that research project or is it your your application and style and structure in general um so always do look at the feedback um but don't don't worry about it okay yeah thank you <laughs> thanks um yeah I, I don't think it's a massive thing to be worried about at this kind of career stage it is the ones i've seen it is it is the kind of people bang, banging in 10 proposals a month <laughs> Which I think I think if you if you get into that kind of productivity, that, <laughs> that's not a problem. It's, and I think the ban is usually only a year or something like that, isn't it? Yeah, it's not it's not a permanent ban. Like sure. like, well, yeah. well, we've said that was enough. <laughs> so, <sorry>. I think <laughs> thanks. Um we've got Yelena 
with her hand up. So can we make her a, a presenter, please? Okay. So, okay. Uh, now, now you can see me. So I have quick questions, a very short one. So um, my team from UK, uh, from System Organization Laboratory, we are applying for NSF EPCRC lead agency agreement with our partners from uh, United States. And we submitted expression of interest because we are the, the, the leading team from UK. However, EPCRC did not send us any confirmation, and we're a little bit scared and on edge. Is this like a common practice not to uh, send us email? Yes, we received the uh, expression of interest, and if this is not normal, who we can contact? We did contact Stephanie and Judith from uh, Manufacturing the Future. So far, we didn't get any response. So I assume they're quite busy. Uh, what is your advice? Um, well, essentially to do what you've done. Um, so Steph is our, uh, our our lead contact on that. So she is definitely the best person to ask. Um, as far as I'm aware, I'm not sure of the of, of the sort of the feedback and whether actually you would find out just yet because it's not just us checking. We do have to check with the other side as well. Yes, and to be yes. honest with you, that is often what holds us up. Um, so I'm sure it has been been looked at and. Um, Steph is actually on leave right now, so when she gets back in, I will I will make a note to, to, yeah, to we, ask her to we, respond to you. We did get feedback from NSF because uh, we are applying for money through the future here, and in the United States, we are applying for EBS, and they they are really like, yeah, we want we are waiting for your proposal, but it doesn't go as fast. Now uh, the second question is, I'm quite on this big project. Now, I, my plan is to submit, uh, to apply for a new investigator board and we will be PI. Does this to interfere or not at all? Sorry, can you say that again? What, what is it you are on? So, I am, this is a big project and of course, since I've never been PI, I'm quite on this uh, uh, project. Oh, right. um, quite, co-investigator. And I, I plan to submit proposal this year for new investigate EPCSC, new investigator award where I will be PI. And I'm scared does this interfere somehow or not at all? No, it shouldn't do. Um if unless unless you were specifically a PI, a, a named PI on the grant, it, it shouldn't interfere. Um again, if you want to send the details across to us, we can double check, but the, the it, standard no, unless you're unless okay. you're PI, it's Okay. 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 That's the only thing. Thank you. Thanks, Helena. Um, right. I think that's that's all the questions there. So I think what we'll do now is um, I'll give you a big round of applause, Katie. Well done. <laughs> um, so if, we're going to pass over to Heather and Ken now for their bit. But Katie, if you want to hang around, there, there might be some questions later on that you you can you can join us back on the stage. Absolutely. So Thank you. Make, cheers, thanks. Can we make um, Heather and Ken presenters, please? So, so Heather and Ken are, are going to talk to us about um, some of the, the way to go about working with industry more effectively. So Heather's um, worked at the UK Atomic Energy Authority, where she's a manufacturing section leader. Ken, I've, I've known Ken for, oh, I think he's coming up to 10 years now. So he's currently the director of Luta Science and Technology, and he has visiting positions at Warwick, Edinburgh and Leeds. But when I met Ken, he was working at Infinium. Um, so they're, they're going to kind of go through some of the, to give you the hints and tips. So we've got Ken. I think we're just waiting for Heather to, to come on board. There we go. So over, over to you guys. Okie dokie. So um, what you've got here is you've got, uh, we thought it'd be a good idea. You've got two generations uh, of scientists here, uh, worked in academia and also uh, industry. And, you know, one of the key things here is that we're both convinced that the industry academic partnership is absolutely key to making real positive progress. So uh, you've got, uh, you've certainly got friends here who uh, are, are very willing to uh, to work, you know, with uh, with ac academics, etc. On that, so I'll and uh, Heather will take the difficult part. <laughs> 
okay, so do you want to take the next slide? Here we go. Just to give you a very brief background. Uh, this is our academic career here. So I did my first degrees at Liverpool. Uh, I'm a chemist uh, originally. Uh, Heather's a physicist, started at Durham, then did a PhD in Oxford, and then worked in the, in the space stuff at Imperial College. Whereas I've come back uh, and I now have visiting positions in Edinburgh and Warwick and Diamond. So that's the academic part. Next. I think there's a lag. I've already pressed it. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our industrial uh, background here. And uh, I'm the top and Heather's the bottom. There's lots on there because I've had over 45 years in, in industry, uh, starting in pharmaceuticals with, uh, with Roche, then uh, naturally joining uh, Esso, uh, Exxon, Exxon Mobil, then a joint venture with Shell. And when I first met Nick, uh, uh, I was with Infinium, which is the, the joint venture. Uh, then I retired from them, set up my own company, Luther Science and Technologies, working in uh, a variety of scientific and technological fields, doing both um, project work, could be for government or, or industry, uh, scientific work and stuff like that. And quite recently, over the past four years or something, I've also joined uh, the Falcon team uh, looking at energetic materials, rocket propellants and uh, stuff like that. And uh, even joined the COVID-19 research with, uh, with Nottingham University uh, over this year. So that's, um, that's progressing. Heather started the industrial side of BAE Systems. Uh, and then joined the government research organization, uh, the Cullum Center for Fusion Energy. So in terms of what we do, we absolutely need Heather to be successful in terms of fusion for everybody's future. Again, the lag. <laughs> uh, just to, to give you a very, very brief idea, uh, we've worked with so many different UK universities. My first two universities, in fact, one at Strathclyde and at UCL, they were the, uh, when we were very early career researchers, we started working with, uh, with those two universities. And uh, one of the interesting things is um, when you start working with academics and build a trust, I'll say a bit more about that later, uh, it tends to last for a long time. So the contact we made in, I think, 1978, and we gave the first grant to in Strathclyde, I'm still working with the same professor now. And uh, at UCL, we started working with uh, a great guy called Professor Mullin. Uh, he's passed away, unfortunately, but we still work with the people that uh, worked under, under him. And you can see the others, I'm not going through them, but uh, you know, once you build up a trust and a successful cooperation, it can last, uh, last a lifetime, literally. But it doesn't only mean we're in the UK. So we've worked with uh, many universities around the world, uh, as far afield as the University of Sydney, uh, even in Saudi Arabia, uh, as you can see, the Netherlands, France, Spain, uh, over in the US, Princeton, Harvard. Uh, we still have some projects with those as well. So we're really used to dealing with many different universities in many different countries uh, and bringing with it the, uh, the benefits and the frustrations uh, with working and trying to get something uh, together. So... Uh, if we go to the next slide, it's, it, it sort of tries to say uh, why work with industry. Uh, I'm taking two extremes here. But uh, we both believe that, you know, it's really important. Uh, and it is important because demonstrating impact to the UK economy is a big factor. We work with 
uh, the local people, you know, Innovate UK, UKRI. And um, it, it is really important. And we both believe that it'll become more important in the future. Um, so if I take two extremes here, um, you know, you work with big companies. Uh, I've worked with what once was the biggest company in the world, uh, ExxonMobil. Um, and that does have uh, big advantages usually. Uh, usually the biggest one is they, they have more money. Uh, they're recognizable big names. Uh, they usually have more scientists and a wider range of topics, something like that. Uh, they can have disadvantages. Uh, they can be slow because of the layers of management uh, on there. Um, the people are likely to change. Now, you notice I've said in one sense, uh, you keep all the partners, etc., throughout almost a lifetime if you build up this trust. Uh, but in, in big companies, they do change. Now, they often come back again, which is interesting. Um, corporate policies are likely to change. So in other words, you know, budgets um, can be uh, adjusted at a moment's notice. Um, and personnel shift. Now, I am working with uh, one big company right now who's the lead of a big government contract, and the project manager has changed four times in a year. Uh, but, you know, you've just got to uh, roll with it in that respect. Uh, now, I'm going to emphasize one thing here, and that IP is a challenge here. Um, getting agreements together uh, can be rather difficult. And we'll say a little bit more about that later. But um, as a young researcher, you know, we would encourage uh, people to take an interest in the IP side uh, on that. But as I say, more about that later. So um, on the other end of this extreme, small companies, right? And I am working with an extremely small company. You know, there are two of us. Um, however... We have started other companies. So the idea being is that if something looks good, we actually create another company. So we created one, for example, with the University of Warwick. And that business is progressing in its own right now. Um, and it's got lots of funding and stuff like that. And that was the direct consequence of working together, industry, very, very small industry, i.e., We've, we're just two people, uh, and we've created a company which now employs, uh, I guess, about 15 at last count. So that's a big advantage, and we can move very, very quickly. Um, it's potentially more innovative on that because we're not bogged down in uh, a lot of uh, corporate, um, what can I say, uh, lack of risk-taking. It's much easier to get attention uh, throughout the whole organization. So for us, of course, it's very, very easy to get the attention of the director and the uh, experimenter. Um, and, you know, right now in the UK, funding is very good. If you look at the uh, emphasis on SMEs, uh, Innovate UK, we've had a number of uh, Innovate UK uh, grants, A4Is, B4Is, with academia. We've led it, but we've had uh, academia in there, and they've been extremely successful. Uh, but of course, most of them are not recognizable names, um, and usually there's less money. That's why the, uh, the funding is, uh, is really so important. So uh, what I will do is pass over to Heather for the rest. Right. Thank you. So, so what should you, what should be you be doing? Um, what is industry looking for um, in, in working with academia, and how can you how can you make this successful so that you can you can build up that trust so that you'll be, be working with these people for the next 30, 40 years um, potentially. Um, so there's different ways to go about about doing this. You want that longer term relationship 
but being open to shorter term work as a start is is really important so it can be very difficult for people to put a lot of money in um right at the start um and it can be easier to build this up so is there a way of doing a three-month contract a six-month contract which can be incredibly difficult um for for universities because um how do you employ someone for that um how do you actually build that into the work that you're you're doing but if there's any flexibility that you have in order to do this that will really sort of mark you out in terms of um how easy industry finds it to be able to work with you um for the longer term relationships um it does often play out that the university is looking at the fundamental understanding of what's going on and then industry is is taking that and looking at more how you apply it to an application um, or something like that. But there needs to be needs to be that trust and that understanding on, on both sides. So the way this, this can be structured, um, a lot of the time um, people ask for letters of support with two days notice, which is incredibly frustrating. So it's great and it's great to be involved through letters of support, um, but that's, that's just one way um, of, of getting a relationship with people. Um, PhDs and postdoc projects are ideal for both parties. That tends to be what, what um, people want to put in place. But the full economic costing of these means it's incredibly expensive. Um, a PhD student might seem like a, a reasonably economic way of getting research done. But when, when you add it all up, um, if that wasn't built into the industries or, in my case, the, the government organization's budget at the start, it isn't something that they can they can just find the money for. Um, necessarily. Um, so then the question is, can you start with something a bit smaller? So we found that um, MSI projects have actually been a, a fantastic way into something. Because if you can use a master's project to prove that something's a good enough idea, it means that I can take it to my senior management and say, you should give me the money for PhD students or postdocs, because I've already proved this works. Like, we've taken the risk out of giving you the funding. So that's a really, really good way, good way to start. Um, and it's, it's really important to be to be proactive on, on both sides. Um, a lot of relationships, the problem is that it goes quiet on one side or both sides for a really, really long time. Um, and sometimes that's fine. But if it's just on one side, then that can be that can be extremely um, frustrating. So it's great to take the lead to arrange meetings yourself um, and to make sure that, this, that you have students there, they're very well prepared and for, for meetings. So actually the relief of somebody else being the driving force of something like this um, can be incredibly helpful um, so that it goes both ways. If somebody's busy at one point, then that, that sort of trades off. So you, you show that you're willing um, to put that energy and that, that effort into it. So the big question is, how do you find these partners? How do you how do you find the people that you you want to be to be working with? Um, so there's, there's there's lots of different ways. I mean, one thing is to potentially um, attend events that are not obviously linked to your research. So you're looking a lot of time for applications. So are there conferences, other events which are a little bit tangential um, to what you would normally be? Um, attending, the way you might meet people. It's amazing how many of these contacts come out of a friendly conversation where you're queuing up for coffee. Um, it is always worth turning around and speaking to the person behind you because you absolutely never know who, who they are. Um, so taking a little bit of a leap and, and trying something new is, is a good idea. There are also these, these calls that come out. So the ones with um, Innovate UK, um, you will all have, will all have heard of. Um, they were the, the ones mentioned earlier about particularly working with SMEs, though, though not necessarily. But then there are also calls that come out which are on particular application areas. So, for example, Sellafield um, put out ones based around nuclear, nuclear fission. They call them game changers. So they put out a problem and they're looking for anyone to come and offer a solution. And these can be anything. These can be looking at corrosion. These can be looking at um, inspection through through metals to what's underneath. Um, they could be looking at gas, different gas detection. So you never know what might come up that might be might be relevant to your your field of, of research. 
Same with things like the Centre for Defence Enterprise. There's so many things people could be looking for. It's worth just keeping an eye um, on things like that. There's also the, the Aerospace Technology Institute, which does the same sort of thing. Um, there will be some which are obviously going to be more relevant for your research than others, um, but it's worth keeping an eye on because then going for these sorts of calls and demonstrating um, to these, these industries that put them out um, that you're yet though you're there and you're doing this is only going to mean that more people more people come come looking to to work with you. So the most important thing for this and for making sure that this this sort of relationship lasts, um, I, I put together PhD studentships and, and work with particular universities at BA Systems. And you'd think in, in fusion, it would be a different set of people, but we've actually continued that relationship and found other things to work on. So even when people do change, if it's a good relationship, if they get a chance, they will come, they will come back to you. So industry has key people just like uh, uh, academia. Um, and if you can, it's great to learn who they are. What's really important here is it's not just the, the most senior people. Um, when you're at a conference and the, the head of whatever division is giving a talk, that's great. But if they've also brought a whole group of people with them, it's often worth engaging with these people. Um, people who might have might have more time um, to, to explore new areas, who might be themselves trying to prove um, what they can achieve. And you can work on, on projects that sort of um, move everybody forward together. Thinking laterally. So in most research areas, there's sort of a, a, an idea of the sorts of applications that your technology, your, your research might be used for. And thinking laterally and trying to make links into other things is really key here. That's where the really amazing ideas are going to come from, from making leaps um, from one field into, into a completely different field. And what's interesting here that, that could be done is making links with other, acad uh, other academics in your departments, um, in your universities, um, with, outside your field. So if you're in the chemistry department, having an understanding of what, who's doing what in physics and or in engineering and all, all those other ideas. Um, we were working on a collaboration with Durham. They've brought in um, Durham Physics Department. They've brought in people from the engineering department and we've um, are pursuing something different because they managed to bring those different those people in. So having an idea of how you can make multidisciplinary links for industry might mean that then you can build up these projects um, which can turn into something into something bigger. So IP was mentioned earlier um, and IP is very is very important. Now, a lot of people, when they think of IP, they think of patents. Um, and it's important not to just assume that um, intellectual property is, is just patents. But what is really important with IP is that you're going to have a big advantage in the conversations you have if you understand enough about it to, to at least have that conversation. So this might be, first off, knowing, knowing who you'd go to to set up a non-disclosure agreement in your department who you would go to in your IP department um, and what the, the standard forms are, how your university feels about IP, that sort of thing, so that um, you're ready to go when you, when you want to put something, something together. It's also important not to just leave everything to the IP department. And this is, this is true whatever industry, in industry or in academia. Um, you need to understand enough yourself. You need to appreciate that everything is a compromise. You're not going to get everything you want, um, and neither is the other party. So be active in, in that, um, that, that trade. Be active in trying to find a mutually beneficial um, way forward with the, with the IP. Um, these, these can be big stumbling blocks. Um, coming from an organization where if we're putting the money in for something, we would expect to own the IP. If we don't put the money in, we wouldn't expect to own it. That seems perfectly reasonable. But that is sometimes where we reach a big stumbling block. So being aware of how important IP is to you, how important the IP of that particular research area is to you or is to your department is really, really important.
And the reason that IP um, isn't just patents and shouldn't be thought of as just patents is particularly because they are expensive to file and to maintain. The costs go up a lot over time. So it's really, it's not an obvious thing to necessarily want to patent something. It should always be kept in mind, but um, you need to consider um, sort of the, the broader um, landscape of IP, everything from just not telling anybody what you're doing right the way up to, to patenting things. But being able to have a good conversation about that with an industry partner, it breeds confidence, it means things move quickly, um, and it'll really be to your to your advantage. So I hope we've given you a an overview of how to find industrial partners um, and then what to do when you find them. Um, and if you've got any questions, we'd be happy to try and answer them if we possibly can. That was brilliant. Thanks, Heather. Thanks, thanks, Ken. I think I think some really good points there. Um, and I think um, from from my own experience, there's um, just having your your kind of ideas ready. I found really helpful. So whenever I start projects and we start getting some results, just having a one pager, a one page document. So I have that for nearly all our projects. So when I meet someone at a conference and they go, "That sounds interesting," then you know I get the card. I can actually say, "Look, here's what we're doing. Have a look." Because often when you start it, you haven't got the publications yet, but you have got some initial results. Um, and the IP one's really interesting because it's not expensive just to file them. Actually, maintaining an IP and making sure people aren't stealing it is costly. So yeah, that's really good. Um, let's see what we've got in the questions. So Stefania, I think um, you put some on. Do you, want, do you want to come on camera? Can we make Stefania a, a presenter, please? If you have any other questions, just just raise your hand and I'll, and I'll come to you. Hi, Stefania. Hi. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Very interesting. Um, I'm early career. And uh, thanks to the feasibility study, I had the opportunity to get in contact with a small company, which is Oxford Space System. So they were in, interesting to the project and they joined. But this is very short project, so six months. And I want to make sure in these six months you have enough time to build uh, trust for a long lasting relationship. So what, what would be the best next proposal or project I could ask them? Should it be Innovative UK? or something like a KTEN, or what will it be your suggestion for this? I think your first instinct to not just be asking them for money and be looking for funding is a fantastic first step. You'd be surprised how often that isn't the, isn't the case. I think the fact that you've done that naturally to start with is already a, a great step in, in building okay. that trust. It shows you're a partnership. You're not just wanting something from them. So I think that's... That's a great way forward. Yeah, so um, places like KTN are always a good place to look um, for the for anything that's sort of space systems related. It's worth keeping an eye on the UK space agency mm. sites because um, they have more specific um, proposals that come out. Um, yeah, yeah. So if, I, I will, yeah, sorry. If if I could add some things, you know, let's say. It, it could be successful and you could build something really good and then go on to get a funded project. Something like the uh, space industry, uh, you'd be surprised how connected it all is. Yeah, no, I know. I mean, in some industries, nobody talks to each other. It's more word to the space industry. It, 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 and they don't. Uh, in some industries, like the pharmaceutical industry, they do pre-competitive research. Mm -hmm. In something like space defense, etc., it's very connected. So if you uh, learn about, uh, you know, what you're doing with one company and perhaps it, it fades out, what you've learned may be able to uh, be applied with, uh, with another company. It's a very, very connected industry. Okay. And I have another question. Instead, I, you mentioned, I think, PhD student, which is actually my biggest problem right now. So how to find uh, funding for PhD student? Because um, I understand EPSRC, for example, does not allow to include uh, salary for PhD, uh, not directly in a grant. And uh, talking with my school, well, you should find the funding. Someone should pay your PhD student, maybe a company, and then company. Hmm. We are not sure if we want to pay for a PhD. So I don't know what is the compromise here to try to find some 
PhD funding. So this is where I'm stuck, really, uh, where I, I have a feeling that it doesn't matter what I do, it doesn't depend too much on me. If you can, if you have an agreement with um, your university that you can do partial funding, so it's much easier if you can find an industry who are willing to part fund it. So then you're talking, what, 58, 55 <laughs> K for the whole project rather than asking someone for a hundred plus K. Okay. That would be a lot easier. <laughs> and so if you know already that you will be able to do that, it's much easier to go in with, with you know, 12 K yeah. Yeah, rather than. Okay. So, so already proposing help. like let's share the cost yeah. should be appealing for a company anyway. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Be more easier. It, if if I could add anything there, uh, we've talked about you know KTN Innovate UK. Uh, probably all of the universities have their own sort of uh, innovation funding. Uh, you know, for, for for example, the one we're dealing with now is Imperial with their accelerator fund. Okay. And it's exactly like you say. You know, it's 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 share sharing the cost, sharing the risk, and it's um, uh, it's it, I think it's beneficial. I agree with Heather. It's uh, okay. usually beneficial for both parties. Yeah, I think I think stuff like this. It's um, I feel your pain. It's something I've always struggled with. You, I, I kind of feel when you start an academic job, you'll have all these great students who want to work with you, and you'll have, and have all, and, and it'll just be so easy. But it's actually probably the thing I I underestimated how difficult it'd be. Yeah. And it's not just finding the funding; it's finding the students. But I think the thing the successful people seem to align themselves with things like CDTs and DTPs, and a lot of these things are, are strategic things within your university. So where I found it's worked well is if, if the university has got a scheme and they say, you know what, we need we need five grand a year from a company, then that it, it, it just de-risks it for the company if, if it's only five grand a year. Because you've got to think about this. If you're working in a company, four years, it goes like that in academia, yeah. but in industry, four years is a lifetime. So And PhD projects, I find, are, are sometimes really high risk for industries. And you get mm. a student who's not quite right or the, it moves. So if it's just if it's just an idea that, that is great, and it's only five grand for them a year. Then, then that's a lot more than than going to them expecting to pay for the whole thing. I think I think that's very difficult. But have a look at the CDTs. CDT. Be loads in, in um, Liverpool. Have a chat with yeah. Pete as well because he, he's usually good at finding these things. And look at your strategic activity. CDTs as well. Universities get block grants from from UKRI to, to fund things like mm. PhD students, case awards, things like that. So you need to know who who runs those accounts and who uh, does the okay. case awards. And find out what you need to find from the different um, uh, industry partners. That's the way to do it. Yeah, because yeah. CDTs will also be being marked on the industries they work with. Yeah, so you yeah. might find that if you come along to your local CDT, if there's if it's a relevant subject and you bring industry with you, then they'll be much more open to um, hmm. collaborative funding. Maybe. Yeah. Thanks. That's very useful. Thank you. No problem, thanks. Has anyone else got any questions? Um, I'm just scrolling to see if we've got any hands up, but I don't think so. Um, I think what we'll do then is, is that's been really useful. Thanks for that, guys. But before you go, I want one top tip from each of you. What's the absolute number one top tip? So you, you can go first, Ken. Oh. <laughs> first, first, day is, first day is an academic. You, you go in your office, you, you put, what's the top tip you can, you can give someone? I I would uh, I would steal one of the points on Heather's slide. You can do the same, Heather. Uh, uh, which is the is the is the lateral thinking bit, uh, and you never know where it leads you. Personally, you know, um, having a, a plan is great, right? Um, but when you're in research, if you follow the plan, you, you, you seldom get there. You always have to deviate from that. And uh, we have an example, Nick, you and I, because uh, I was dealing with environment, environmental impacts in fuels, and I wanted to use ultrasound to, um, to, to, to look at fuels, automotive fuels. We were working with academics, but where did we find the... Uh, the lateral thinking part of this, we went to the food science department, yeah. where Nick was, 
and we use food science to actually apply to a completely different industry. So it's, you know, the, the, best, the best progress is always made by uh, research-led uh, progress. Mm. That, that, that would be my top tip. They're, they're, from my experience, the big impact has never been what I originally set out to do. Yeah. And we were the only food science lab with a full car exhaust system. <laughs> yeah. Uh, before I come to you, Heather, you, uh, we have actually got a hand raised, so I'm just going to get them to ask their questions. So can we make uh, Elena uh, a speaker, please? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Yeah. My daughter. Okay. Uh, anyhow. <laughs> so uh, this one is the question I have. We do have. Yes, uh, we do. Um, how should I say this? Not not collaborate. We start collaborating with uh, uh, different industrial partners, but it is it is quite a different game. And uh, the first thing uh, that they ask is uh, what you can give me, and uh, can that be done in two weeks? That is pretty much how they think. Uh, and we are like, uh, no, because that's research, it needs some time, and they don't kind of understand that. That's the first thing. And second thing, I, um, one of um, one professors in the United States, he said, when you talk with people from industry, you need to go uh, other way around. You cannot go uh, with a problem statement, this is the method, and so on. You need to say, these are the outcomes, and go backward. So they're interested in, in the outcomes. So, um, your advice to us, younger generation, is how we can uh, present or establish this, this connection without losing them because they lose patience in the process. They don't understand we need some time uh, to, to establish collaboration, to do the project. Um, so I, I think in terms of the people who expect you to be able to, to um, do, do all the research in two weeks, um, I think the only, I mean, they're wrong, aren't they? So the only thing you can do is send them back a well thought through plan of what you can do and then what that's going to get them. So you might find that they don't reply immediately, but when in six months time mm -hmm. they've still got that same problem, then maybe they actually will come back to this as a document and go, oh, okay, okay, to solve this, we're actually are going to have to put more time into it. But if they have something that they can refer back to, not just trying to remember mm -hmm. who it was they spoke to six months ago, then that'll be much easier. So sending them something where you you, you said, oh, we can't do that for these reasons. However, here's what we can do, and this is what it'll get you. I think that would be a really proactive way to, to deal with it because that's something that then they, they will remember they've got. Um, and it's something that, they can almost have as a, as a backup plan if if whatever it is they they're planning on doing if they can't do it in two weeks fails. Yeah, I, I see. Okay, that, that's good advice. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I think it's about sort of managing expectations, isn't it? In between between um, partners. So Heather, we'll have your we'll end with your your one top tip. My, my one top tip. So I would say all the people who you were in the same sort of cohort with when you were doing your PhDs, so not necessarily at the same university, but all those people you ran into at those conferences over and over and over again, keep an eye on what they're doing and keep in touch. So I've run into people since there's one guy who's doing um, uh, using x-rays to look at things at the British Museum, another guy who started his own company. Um, we weren't best of friends, but we knew each other. We we know enough to sit around and chat at all the conferences we'd end up at together. And they're the people who are now reaching out to me and going, oh, hang on, we want to do x-rays, experiments, and the same sort of things you do. Shall we be cross-sector together? Or you've just started a sensor company and I need a sensor for this. How can, you know, remember me? So I think keeping in touch if you can um, and keeping an eye out for, for those people um, would be would be a good thing to do. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, it's a small world and it, it gets smaller the older you get. Yeah. So, yeah, brilliant. <laughs> That's it's a really good point. So you, you'll get your one man round of applause. So <laughs> thanks a lot for that. And then, thanks to Katie as well as around earlier. So I hope, I hope everyone found that really, really useful. I think that, that was some great um, talks and we'll have the, all them slides on, on our website. Um, 
And I think the, the most important thing to say is, is, as I mentioned at the start, we're really dedicated to supporting early career researchers. So um, it's great. Some of you from yesterday have always already got in touch with, with me with ideas of things we should do with the network. And if there's more things you want us to do, more events like this, um, just let us know know what help you want, and, we're, and we'll, we're here to we're here to provide it. So that's the end of the session. So thanks everyone, and I hope to see you soon.